continuing, um, as children get beyond age one, especially as they begin to reach two, uh, that's the point where you're supposed to be, it's a little more nuanced in how you uh, are to interact with your uh, child uh, as, a, as a parent uh, or other adult. Uh, prior to one, uh, you're more so available to them on demand. Uh, you know, when the baby gets the baby wants, they're crying, etc. You have to give them attention and, and help them out because they're totally dependent on you. But as, as children grow, uh, they become more dependent and it is the uh, duty of a, of, a, of a proper parent to uh, extend increasingly more opportunity and independence uh, as they age. And we'll talk about why that's beneficial as we, as we go through this. Um, certainly by age two and, and from age two to four, it is the role of the parents primarily to socialize uh, children. Uh, there was a sort of, how would you phrase this, long-standing debate about how to uh, address childhood development, uh, what sort of impact you had as a parent. Uh, it turns out that there is there is uh, a substantial impact, impact that the parents have, but the abilities and preferences and, and motivations of people, not just children, but people as they grow are, are largely biologically driven, but you do have some impact as a parent uh, as far as um, socializing them and providing them with a stable structure uh, to allow for normal pro-social development. So uh, again, the role, especially after two, so you could say two to four, uh, the uh, role of uh, developmental focus is on socialization. And we'll talk about the various uh, genetic components as far as development and personality, like we already have, as well as the environmental. And this is a more so an environmental one because this is the way and <clears throat> structure with which you, you raise children. So, socializing. What we mean by socializing is preparing them to engage in pro-social behaviors to develop positive relationships with people. And that's more nuanced than it sounds. Um, and this is kind of where the, the, the split long ago occurred as far as how to approach children and, and upbringing and, and views of society. Uh, so this goes back probably further, but certainly it's codified by a, an, an informal argument or a formal argument uh, across time between um, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau uh, during the Age of the Enlightenment uh, and um, Hobbes uh, in the UK, I think Scotland, uh, in the UK, where... Uh, Hobbes had a much more socialized view of children in that human beings by nature were, were impulsive and driven by intuition and emotions uh, and that society was required to rein them in and not just make them acceptable to others but for them to actually succeed and thrive. Uh, and that in not doing so, you would have this you know, volatile, chaotic state of uh, violence and all this antisocial activity and, and suffering uh, that, that you require socializing in society to actually uh, correct these natural impulses uh, and antisocial behaviors in order to, to, to proceed uh, as an individual and, and a community uh, towards flourishing, essentially. Rousseau, while he did endorse having a functional society, believed more so in uh, a, a set it and forget it approach to let nature and children's intuitive nature and imagination um, function without interruption and allow them to uh, develop on their own and, and experience the world as they experience it without guidance or restriction or constraint uh, from parents. So it was two very extreme views, but over time the data, and this isn't an opinion, the data overwhelmingly suggests that Hobbes had the uh, correct view. Uh, going back, whether it's on the societal level, from analyzing hunter-gatherer and early horticultural uh, societies and their uh, rates of violent death and, and inequality and all of that compared to today, uh, or just actual parenting, tracking them from a young age all the way into adulthood and weighing their outcomes of success as, as far as quality relationships and with, with romantic partners and friends and family stability and, and economic success or career success and uh, basically all measures likelihood uh, to end up in prison or not, all of the measures are, are overwhelmingly uh, in favor of a more 
inter of a, of a more proactive parenting, not not a set it and forget it, let the kid be the kid, um, and, and we'll talk about the nuances there. So that's primarily the the role for a parent from age two to four. Uh, Social reason from two to four. Now it's going to on go extend beyond two to four, but the reason why it's so important from two to four is, at about age two to three in that range, kids have a little more grasp of language, um, and they have a little more understanding. You can actually communicate with them. They can communicate their needs. You can communicate uh, yours, uh, and and you can start helping them understand the world as they go through it. From age two to four, kids are like peer impulse. This is why they can go from insanely happy and excited, like having the most fun you've ever seen, um, because they're just they're just having fun. And that's usually like their kind of default. They're just running around, exploring, seeing things, experiencing things, and they're just on this high uh, a lot of the times. And it can be kind of um, kind of a buzzkill as a parent to, to constantly be reining them in and be like, stop it, stop having uh, so much fun because they're just, they're so wild. Uh, and they're wild because they're having so much fun. They're running around tearing the house up and jumping around and screaming and, and, and drawing things and eating things and throwing things and breaking things and having a great time. They're not trying to harm people. Well, not necessarily. They, they might be. Uh, but they can very quickly turn that into incredibly sad uh, or incredibly hungry or incredibly angry, right? And they throw these tantrums. Uh, and your job as a parent is to make sure that you sort of rein them in and bring them more towards a more complacent uh, mindset uh, and attitude and temperament. Uh, because if you allow them to be just over the top and swing from side to side without concern for others, um, that's going to be a, a, a very negative set of characteristics to carry on to uh, early childhood, uh, in school, uh, middle school, high school, and adulthood. Uh, it will not serve to your favor. Um, so, what parents have to do here is, here's where you have to set reasonable rules for that establish pro-social behaviors, like, you know, having an inside voice, right? You can be happy, but screaming is not acceptable. Um, violence, unless perhaps in, in the form of self-defense, uh, is not an acceptable behavior. Uh, that's a very antisocial behavior, biting, hitting, scratching, kicking, all those things unwarranted, you know, non, not for the purpose of self-defense or perhaps the defense of another, uh, is not an acceptable behavior. Uh, and that will, of course, end you up uh, certainly in trouble at school, expelled, possibly uh, in a detention center or uh, as, an, as an adult in prison. Um, so that's, that's a behavior you have to, to correct and rein in. Uh, other ones, you have to be considerate of others, right? You can't just, um, you know, eat your food, make a mess, and, or, or take somebody else's stuff. You can't steal from them. You can't uh, pester them and annoy them when they ask you to stop. You have to stop. Those are things you have to establish because if you don't, the kid learns to abide by those rules and they see the world as their sort of play thing. Uh, and they, they, care, they carry those behaviors on, maybe not as extremely as, as a two-year-old does, but they carry those on and, and those are all antisocial behaviors uh, and markers, things that will annoy people, adults and children, and even though the adults might tolerate them because you know they're a kid and you know they sort of have to, they're certainly less likely to uh, reach out to help or 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 aid or guide a or even have over like as a as a as a you know like you know two kid friends coming over to the one kid's house. The parents not going to want the terror kid to come over to their house. They're not going to get invited, and they might not even want their kid to go over to the terror kid's house because uh, they fear the influence that might have on them. Uh, so it's going to really, really limit the opportunity of, of that kid if you don't rein in that behavior because they're not going to get appreciation or guidance or help from adults as they grow up and they're also going to have less friends uh, and they're going to experience more um, uh, contention because as they go into the school system and they misbehave and teachers uh, enforce their rules, they, they don't see them as rules set in place for, for social order and, and, and harmony and, and allowing people to exchange ideas and learn. Uh, and behave appropriately, not, not harm each other. Uh, they see the enforcer, uh, or this the teacher, or the police officer later, whoever is, as, as like a villain that's just there to stop them, uh, and, and it, as rather than like a, a functional social uh, mechanism for maintaining harmony, stability, and, and, and liberty for, for everybody else. So if you don't, if you fail to do that at this at this stage from two to four, uh, and then and the kid reaches age four with no socialization, you throw them out into the uh, preschool or, or later kindergarten system, um, 
you've lost your opportunity, and there's actually a, a, an extensive literature on this, uh, if your child is, is still gripped by antisocial behaviors, especially violent ones, uh, by age four, and you send them off into the world, uh, increasingly in school, uh, the odds that they will end up in prison uh, are exponentially higher, extremely high uh, relative to the norm. Um, and that, that, that is a cycle that they often cannot escape uh, on their own. They often end up in prison repeatedly, uh, and they only begin to sort of pull back on that deleterious behavior that ends, winds them up in prison um, starting at about age 27 and onward. Uh, and that's sort of what the literature and numbers suggest too, is that antisocial kids from ages four onwards, as, as they go out of the world, they basically just end up in prison until they're past age 27, and that's really been the only way to make sure there's not a bunch of, uh, an excessive amount of, of, of aggression, violence, theft, etc., cetera, uh, in society. Uh, so don't take that role uh, lightly, because it can be a frustrating one uh, as you are socializing. So uh, again, the, the role here is to, uh, uh, you want to model it yourself, pro-social behavior, so you don't want to, of course, do the things that you say they shouldn't do, like you know, when you tell them not to raise their voice or not to be aggressive or violent, and, and you ex are exuding those by yelling or throwing things or whatever. Uh, the, old, the old adage of uh, rules for thee but not for me is, is not one that, that functions. Uh, the, the child's not going to learn from that. They're going to see you do it, and even though you're telling them not to, they're, they're going to go and do it, certainly when you're not there. So um, you've got to sort of, sort of demonstrate or model, demonstrate, and uh, consistently enforce um, a reasonable set of rules, reasonable pro-social uh, behaviors. And what you want to do is when, when antisocial behaviors emerge, you want to either punish or discourage them somehow, like the operant conditioning wise, uh, because you want to discourage that behavior, you want to do that immediately and consistently. That means not letting them get away with it sometimes because you're tired or you're embarrassed because some, someone else might be seeing another parent or, or you've already done it three times and you're giving up. Uh, it has to be consistently, uh, just like uh, the findings of Skinner have suggested, it has to be consistent and uh, immediate uh, responses to the behavior, whether it's to discourage with punishment or to encourage uh, with reinforcement. So again, uh, they do something, they throw a fit, throw a tantrum, and you put them on timeout until they calm down and they can't get up. Uh, you have to do that immediately every time. Even if they get right up and do it again, you've got to send them right back to it again, which can be an incredibly frustrating and uh, arduous and and time-consuming endeavor, uh, but, it, but it's a necessary one. Uh, and uh, on the flip side, you always want to reward or reinforce the uh, desired behaviors immediately as well. So, you know, when they're, when they're uh, waiting patiently for something or they're behaving in public or they ask please or they say thank you or they clean up after themselves, those sorts of things need to be positively uh, uh, or negatively reinforced immediately uh, through uh, praise or some other sort of uh, um, uh, reinforcement, whether it's taking away something they don't like, a negative reinforcement, or giving them something they do like with a positive reinforcement, like a, a, a treat. Or for the, the negative reinforcement, maybe removing a, a chore they have to do or, or something like that uh, for, for, uh, for demonstrating for social behavior. All right, that's kind of what your role is. And um, like I mentioned before, there's a fair, fairly strong set of literature that, that suggests what the correct path is. If, you're, if your overall goal, which it should be as a parent, is to develop a uh, child to be a, 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 a pro-social person who uh, is not denied opportunities due to their um, uh, lack of control, self-control, and, and antisocial behavior. Um, the primary or initial researcher that sort of looked at various parenting styles and attempted to analyze the results, there were some critics which we'll talk about, but overall it, it paints a pretty accurate picture of ways you can parent and then the outcomes of those uh, various uh, ways. So the, uh, uh, it was the 1950s when she started going into the 80s, uh, it was uh, Diana Baumrind, and she observed a plethora of, uh, of parents and tracked them on longitudinal studies uh, and checked in later to, to, to see how these, um, as they progressed and later, uh, to see how these uh, kids turned out as far as their success goes uh, or, 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 or net happiness or fulfillment of life. 
And again, the measures for that are, you know, likelihood that they'll go to prison, uh, dropout rates, uh, grades, um, what else? Uh, fulfillment in, in, in positive relationships with others, whether it's romantically uh, or whether it is um, with a just basic friendship uh, and then career success, college success and onward. Um, there were some trends. So she did some work on parenting styles. And again, we'll, we'll mention some criticisms and some contemporary revisions, but uh, nonetheless, the initial three uh, were influential in uh, analyzing the development uh, or the behavioral development of children going on up into uh, and through uh, adolescence. So we're focusing again on certainly two to four, but then also beyond that. So, you know, the, the, the five to 17, 18 range as well, maybe beyond that. Uh, for certain uh, scenarios and situations. So there's basically three styles according to Baumrin. Uh, there's authoritarian. There's, and it sounds very familiar. I don't know if you guys know history at all, but authoritarian, it's kind of like a totalitarian. They're the ones that are kind of absolute my way or the highway, uh, brutal, brutal, brutal enforcement. Uh, and there's authoritative, as in more so reflecting like somebody who has a lot of knowledge and know-how and you should listen to them and if you don't, there are gonna be consequences, but reasonable ones, uh, authoritative. And then uh, there's permissive, the um, parents who are <clears throat> not providing any sort of stability or structure or, or discipline, or, or at least far less, uh, going all the way down to just being completely permissive or absent. Right? And this can also, by the way, be unintentional. Like perhaps you have a uh, fatherless household um, and you have a single, single mother and she has to work two jobs or something along those lines and she might not be permissive herself, but she's just not able to be around as much. So these kids don't have the structure simply because they're just with their aunt or their grandma or they're not home hardly at all because their moms aren't hardly home. Uh, that sort of thing. So it can be an absent parent by choice or by not, or not by choice, uh, as well as parents that just sort of take the Rousseauian approach of just letting the kid go and experience it and find out for themselves, which we know does not bode well uh, statistically. All right, so authoritative, or sorry, authoritarian. Uh, these are the ones that you probably think of as being too strict. Uh, these are absolute uh, rulers of parents. Um, being strict isn't necessarily uh, a, a defining characteristic, but these are the ones that are not responsive. They have absolute rules, probably rules that are a bit um, over the top uh, as far as the, the, uh, the punishment fitting the crime. Um, maybe they do something minor, but like, I don't know, uh, don't say please. No, it's kind of extreme. They don't, let, let's say they uh, call a kid a name, right? And that should be merit some sort of punishment. Uh, but instead of like giving them a timeout and making them apologize or something like that, they, they like ground them for a week. All right, and, and let's assume it wasn't, it was a mild name too, like they called them dumb or something like that, which is bad, but um, they would just go way over the top with the, with the enforcement. And they wouldn't explain the rules either. They'd just be, because I said so, or because I'm the parent, and they would just rule with an iron fist without question or explanation. So absolute rulers, um, a bit tyrannical in nature. Uh, and they are going to be defined by their lack of uh, engagement uh, with child, All right? So instead of explaining why we can't do that or why we shouldn't do that or why we should do this, they just, it's because I said so or, and they don't really give you a reason, which can be frustrating for most kids because if you're trying to understand why you can or can't do something, you know, because I said so is often not a, uh, an adequate rationalization. Uh, one that will elicit uh, future uh, compliance with that rule. Um, on the other hand, though, the authoritative parents, while they are, are going to be uh, potentially strict, likely strict, they are going to provide a, a strict uh, and stable structure. So rules, and, and they enforce those rules, and there are punishments for violating them, but there are also rewards for, for um, um, upholding them. Right, so and this one might also be characterized by you know not reinforcing you know the, the positive behaviors and only focusing on the negative. This one though is more open and encouraging. So you will will punish and discourage certain antisocial behaviors, but you will also reinforce and and encourage uh, positive uh, or pro-social behaviors. 
Uh, so strict stable structure uh, with a mix of reinforcement uh, and uh, punishment. But also, you're not just ruling with iron fists, the old, because I told you so, or because I'm your mom, or because I'm your dad, or whatever. Uh, you actually would, depending on the scenario, actually explain to them why there's a rule there. They might say, oh, I won't do that, or that won't happen to me. Like, well, statistically, it, it probably will. So until you're this age, or whatever, we're not going to have you do this. Um, and tell them why that age is an appropriate age. Like, oh, well, but then your, your motor skills are more developed, and you walking up there on that, that high beam is, uh, is much less dangerous than, than it is right now. Uh, or something like that. Um, so, uh, strict stable uh, structure, reinforcement, punishment, and you are, are going to also explain the rules uh, and adjust them too uh, as the uh, children are, become you know, mature uh, biologically, physically, in, the, in their behavior and abilities. Uh, you're more mm, open to that. Uh, the permissive, though, uh, as their name suggests, uh, provide little to no structure. Uh, or consistency. Oh, and this is also generally uh, consistent. Oh, I said stable, so that's covered. Um, those are kind of the three general approaches. It is more of a spectrum with the extreme uh, at one end, at, at the extremes at either end, and, and sort of a, a middle or, or slightly uh, towards the uh, uh, more strict side uh, with authoritative. But that that's kind of the, the, the rough three. And what they found was uh, certainly with these two, some fairly consistent, valid uh, results that corroborated the, uh, the overall theory. This was the one that was a bit inconsistent and recently, as of like the 90s and, and early 2000s, it's sort of been debunked to, a, to an extent, uh, although there is a degree of truth, a uh, shred of truth in it, which we'll talk about here in a second. So let's first start with uh, these two because it, we have pretty clear results. These two have drastically different outcomes. Um, the permissive students, or sorry, the permissive parents often have children that are not successful across the board. So these are kids that are generally uh, far more impulsive. And that's, that's not a good thing. Um, going out and uh, doing whatever you want because you want to isn't always, in fact, it usually isn't uh, the best idea. Uh, it can cause you to harm others or harm yourself in the future by abusing substances or engaging in activities that are too risky or, or neglecting or, or shirking responsibilities like your, uh, your, your finances or your education or your job, whatever it might be. Uh, they're more impulsive. They are often uh, less fulfilled or happy in adulthood. They often... Uh, have strained uh, relationships, whether it be romantic or um, just, you know, friendship-based, uh, non-sexual friendship-based. Um, they are also gonna be what I put, impulsive, less filled, strained relationships. Oh, they're much more likely to uh, engage in the following, uh, or suffer from the following negative developments. More likely to end up in prison, Uh, dropping out of high school, um, get divorced. They're more likely to, what else do they suffer from? Uh, they have less career success. And they are statistically more likely to be, uh, to have, to exhibit antisocial behaviors. Uh, obviously the worst of those being um, violence. Uh, and aggression, uh, which they are also more aggressive, I should add that as well, uh, whether it's physically or uh, relationally, uh, although the physical one tends to get you in more trouble more quickly. All right, so those are the, the negative outcomes. And again, one thing I want to mention here, though, <clears throat> since temperament is actually quite important, uh, as it's largely genetically driven. So your, your, your degree of fulfilledness and complacency and orderliness and uh, interests are largely genetically driven. Um, so for example, I could be someone who's naturally rather calm and considerate uh, or, or studious and orderly. And even though my parents aren't there or they provide me no structure, I end up being successful anyway just because I happened to uh, be predisposed to be that way based on my temperament uh, and personality, which is, which is genetic. But 
um, I'm much more likely to uh, succumb to uh, developmental failures as far as reigning in my impulsivity and, and being considerate of others and uh, reigning in my aggression and antisocial behavior. So again, if I, if I naturally sort of been predisposed to avoid those things, which can happen, uh, this won't be as much of a factor, but if it's someone who's borderline or, or is inclined to have these things and they're not corrected over time, uh, you end up with a much worse result. Um, authoritative, though, uh, providing a strict, uh, stable structure uh, and reinforcing pro-social papers and, and, and punishing or discouraging antisocial uh, has some, some uh, immense benefits. Uh, it's basically the opposite of almost every statistic here. They're less likely uh, to suffer from these detriments, so they're uh, less likely to be imprisoned, drop out, exhibit antisocial behaviors, etc. They're often uh, happier and more successful uh, in relationships and career uh, and just life in general. Um, they're also generally more confident, too. Because uh, part of this, and I actually didn't mention this, is encouragement. Authoritative parents uh, encourage their children to, to uh, foster independence, to go out and try things and, and to be resilient in the face of a challenge or adversity or a failure. Uh, you know, not showing them that, it doesn't show that they are a failure, but a failure is a, a learning mechanism with which they can use uh, to grow and improve, and that's how humans operate. No one just rolls out and starts wrecking everything first try all the way until they die. Uh, people fail often, uh, or there are others who just happen to be better at it, and you've got to put in a fair amount of time and effort to, to close the gap with that person or exceed them or, or whatever it might be. Um, authoritative parents are generally much better at doing that with their encouragement. Uh, and they'll do realistic encouragement, too, like, yeah, you lost, and that person's better, but here's how you get better. Whereas a permissive parent that's either not there to give them encouragement, the, the kid might think that they're a failure, or uh, they might be the permissive, like, overly compassionate parent who just gives them whatever they want and doesn't ever stop them and says, no, you're the best anyway, and just outright lies to them. And so they go on thinking they are the best and uh, develop this sort of delusion of of grandeur and, and narcissism, that they're the best, and if you beat them, it's because you cheated or you're, you're a bad person. Um, so there's a big difference there. Uh, Baumrin's initial findings asserted that these parents who are authoritarian uh, actually, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Impaired uh, social development and confidence. Confidence. But, um, there have been quite a few longitudinal studies uh, done since the 1990s and early 2000s on um, some populations that generally tend to be more authoritarian. Um, there's uh, some studies from uh, several East Asian cultures that have far more authoritarian parenting styles, uh, as well as some in the um, uh, Muslim communities and I think some Jewish communities as well. Um, I might be mixing one of those up, but they looked at several populations that have much more uh, authoritarian type parenting styles, and they didn't really notice in the long run. Assuming, of course, they're not, you know, inducing physical violence and trauma and pain and abuse, uh, that would obviously um, negatively impact their development. We're talking about parents that are overly strict and, and maybe don't reason with the kids or whatever. Uh, it actually shows to have very negligible impact on their overall uh, success and outcome. Uh, so certainly this is a beneficial approach and ba backed by data. This is also a detrimental approach, which is equally backed by data. So this is the direction you want to lean in. This is the direction you want to avoid. Uh, you have to find that balance. Uh, too much compassion or too much negligence is going to result in greatly increasing the odds of your, your, your child not being successful. Uh, whereas providing structure and encouragement and, uh, uh, and a balanced degree of, of, of empathy and, and encouraging resilience uh, actually prepares them best for the future. And uh, going a little bit too on the strict end or uh, the absolute end doesn't appear to have much of a negative or positive impact on the uh, uh, success of the adult in the long run. And again, that's according to several... Uh, um, high population longitudinal studies coming out of um, cultures that have authoritarian parenting styles. But uh, these ones 
were corroborated by later findings. This one was more so disputed. Uh, but those are the three that you may have to talk about uh, on the actual AP test. So uh, one of the important things I want to mention here while, while on, on, on this topic is uh, this is an increasingly common American parenting style. Not so much in Europe and other parts of the world, but this is an increasingly uh, popularized American one. And there's a lot of research uh, coming from a, um, well, several people, but certainly a psychologist uh, named uh, Dr. Uh, Jonathan Haidt. Uh, he started his work, I believe, in the late 80s, and he's still going to now. Uh, he had um, a lot of work about <clears throat> parenting that's overly protective. And I, I don't even mean permissive, uh, because this can mean protective or permissive. In fact, I won't actually put it arrow there, an arrow there. Uh, he had some research on a topic that was coined, it wasn't by him, it was by, uh, there's actually some engineer that can't coin the term, uh, but they did some research and um, no one's been able to uh, counter their claim despite attempts to, uh, it's been upheld that humans are actually, and children as they develop, are actually what's called anti-fragile as they develop. <clears throat> now, fragile means you break. Uh, like if I dropped a glass, this is the, this is the, the this is roughly speaking the um, analogy gives. Uh, fragile means you break. So if I drop a glass, it just shatters, now it's broken and I can't use it. Um, something that's got a fixed shape, like a plastic cup, it's like I drop that, but it doesn't change. Uh, so, you know, giving it resistance doesn't actually affect it at all. It doesn't change at all. So I drop the plastic up, it just stays the same. Um, giving, uh, providing resistance or, or force to a glass though, can break it, damage it, can't use it forever. Humans are like neither of those things. So they're one's fragile and then one's you know not fragile, it's robust. Uh, Anti-fragile actually is a unique term, which means it won't, assuming that the damage doesn't break it, like literally kill it, uh, or traumatize it beyond repair, uh, actually, Presenting the entity with uh, some adversity or resistance actually causes that um, entity to grow, become stronger over time. It's much like uh, another good analogy would be uh, muscles. <clears throat> you're not going to oh, a few steroids, you will, but assuming you're not using steroids uh, and you're trying to build muscle mass the, uh, the traditional way, the, the, the anatomically correct way, um, you can't get stronger just by you know, thinking about things. You have to go out and actually strain your muscles to the point that they actually break a little bit. So you're, you're putting stress on them to the point that uh, testing them causes your body to respond to that stress and strain, that damage actually, that light amount of da damage, by building it back and repairing it, not to the same as it was, but actually a little bit stronger and a little bit better than it was before. And you do this repeatedly across the weeks, across the months, across the years, and after you know, one day of doing this, it's, you look exactly the same, but doing that, you know, consistently and properly across the week and allowing rest, uh, you'll look like a whole different person uh, afterwards because your muscles have been strained constantly, strained constantly, recovered, strained constantly, recovered, and, and grown uh, to become more uh, robust. So anti-fragile actually means um, resistance is required for growth and durability. It's not only do uh, your muscles grow, but they can actually handle a higher load now, right? So that, and that's what the, the increasing weight is. You might, you might uh, if you're a typical high school guy or whatever, you might start out with you know, a 135 bench or maybe that's even too hard for you. Uh, but if you properly uh, do your, 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 whatever your weights class is for the right year and you get the nutrition and the rest, you do it across the entire year, you're gonna be benching way more than 135 by the end of it. Uh, because you've been straining and stressing uh, your, your muscles, they've grown, and they're now more durable and actually more powerful, so you can actually lift higher amounts. Uh, human beings are the same way. Uh, and it's also like the immune system, too. Uh, if, if, if I'm protected from the outside world by a bubble, I'm kept in a room and, and no pathogens are ever let in, sure, I won't. I won't die because no pathogens come in. But as soon as I go out into the world and my immune system's never been tested before and has no antibodies and has no experience uh, and a lack of resources and practice, uh, I am way, way, way more vulnerable to infection if I have never been exposed to it before. 
Uh, so even though sicknesses over time, just like building weights is a strain, uh, is actually you know a negative experience at the time, once you recover from it, the exposure actually made you stronger because now you actually have experience in your uh, immune system. It's got more antibodies and memory cells to fight future infections. Uh, so anti-fragile means expose it in order for it to uh, become stronger and grow. And that's actually uh, what humans uh, are actually like. So parents, uh, whether regardless of the style that they're using, um, permissive parents probably wouldn't be Either not, either they're not there, or they're, or they're overly compassionate to their to their children. They want to protect them from any negative experiences. Um, you're actually supposed to encourage your your child to go out and try things and risk failing, um, because as they familiarize themselves with situations uh, and and they understand them, so they're not anxious about them because they already understand them. They know they've done them, uh, and they they gain experience and their competency grows and they get better. Uh, you actually start. You, you program and, and start this sort of snowball effect of, of developing a mentally resistant and competent uh, child, one who's used to facing unknown situations and adversity, uncomfortable situations, uh, ones that might be um, uh, displeasing in some way, like giving a speech or getting into an argument with somebody uh, or uh, going into a competition wh which they could lose. Right, not get a participation trophy, but they could actually just lose and not get anything. Um, as they deal with those things, they become accustomed to them, uh, and they learn that you know that does that's not the end of my world. I can actually survive it, and I can actually learn from it and improve and, and grow stronger. So we should actually foster independence uh, by encouraging and sort of uh, not literally pushing, but encouraging and, and pushing kids forward. Uh, right to the edge of where they are comfortable. So not too much, like you're, you're exposing them to too much and they get overwhelmed, they can't handle it. That might traumatize them and they'd be afraid to try new things. Uh, but you have to expose them to things that are like optimally difficult, like they're just within their range of ability uh, or difficulty or understanding to the point that it's hard for them and they're gonna struggle and they might fail, uh, but uh, overall they can learn from it or they can succeed and overcome it. Uh, and benefit from it. Um, so that finding that midpoint of, of encouragement and exposure, um, and even a little push uh, metaphorically here and there, is a beneficial thing, even if the child experiences anxiety or discomfort uh, or, or, or you know tries to avoid it. You should actually, it's your job as a parent to encourage them to do it um, and not overprotect, overcoddle, you know, censor them and, and, and well, I already said coddle, but, uh, try to make the world too perfect or nice for them. Uh, they're called snowplow parents, by the way, as in like, instead of the kid having to go out and, and dig his own, uh, 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 shovel his own driveway or road and, and figure out how to drive in the snow and all that and deal with the, uh, the hardships, but, but learn from it that the, the parent just <clears throat> snow plows the road and the kid just walks on it with no idea how to deal with a situation where their parent isn't there, but they have uh, snow in their way. So anti-fragile, and this actually is in line with uh, another uh, developmental uh, psychologist, an early one, unintentionally. It was a guy named Lev Vygotsky. Uh, it's very much in line with this spirit, Vygotsky. Um, he suggested there was an optimal degree of difficulty for students to learn and grow from. So this is the idea, Height's idea, this modern one, is the idea that uh, we should stray away from this overly compassionate, permissive parenting where we're overprotecting children and, and sort of force them to engage in things that are uncomfortable so they get accustomed to it and grow. Uh, Vygotsky kind of said a similar thing about learning. You should not give kids something that's too easy to learn because they'll become bored with it and then they're, they're not going to benefit or grow from learning something they already know or something that's too easy. But if you overwhelm them by giving them something too complex or too difficult, they'll be discouraged because they can't understand it and they'll give up and they'll think they're stupid or whatever it might be. So when you're trying to get somebody to learn something, um, it should be information or a topic or a task that is difficult but doable. Maybe they require some guidance and some help from a peer or, or a teacher, but it's something they could actually do uh, on their own, even if it requires a bit of help. It doesn't mean do it for them, but um, as a teacher or a parent or, or even an individual child, 
you should be giving your child or student or you yourself giving yourself tasks and um, uh, objectives or, 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 or learning goals that are, are almost out of reach but not quite out of reach, that require a great degree of effort, difficulty, um, discomfort, perhaps some guidance and advice from others, but it's something you can do and grow and learn from. Uh, and that was what he referred to as the uh, zone of proximal learning. And it's sort of a sweet spot where, you know, too easy, you have no growth, and you're also not encouraged to uh, learn because uh, it's boring and it's quick. And in fact, you actually get so used to successfully knowing it that you are, are avoid things that are difficult because you might not learn them easily or quickly. Uh, but if you go with something that's too difficult, far beyond their um, ability, that will discourage them because they might think that they're not capable or they're, 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 they're not good enough or there's no point in trying. It's sort of a learned helplessness thing. If I can't affect the outcome, then why would I even try to do anything? Um, you have to find this sort of middle ground where it's uh, still difficult, and this is where the zone of proximal learning was to him. Here's the zone. Oh, I forgot the word zone there perfectly without trying. Uh, this is the uh, area of optimal difficulty. Difficult, a strain, um, uh, perhaps uncomfortable, whatever the skill or, or topic might be, maybe requires some help, uh, but you are able to do it uh, by your help, by yourself, or with minimal guidance on your own and learn and grow from it. That's what the zone of proximal development was. Uh, Height's a recent guy, he's still active. Um, and he's pushing this, um, uh, it's not just his opinion by the way, it's backed by uh, the research of him and his, and his, his peers. Uh, it's well documented, it's got a, a, a what's the word I'm looking for? A broad set of um, convincing data uh, to suggest that American parenting especially in the recent generation or two has been too um, overly compassionate, too protective to the point that they're actually making their children vulnerable to uh, trying new things and actually have shown statistical increases not only in the diagnoses of um, depression, anxiety, and other mood disorders, uh, but also admittance to a hospital for uh, self-harm. So it's not just people are more open and accepting uh, and, and willing to share their, their um, uh, mental illnesses but they, or psychological disorders, but they're also uh, actually doing them to the point that they're not just saying it, they're, they're doing it. it. It's a real phenomenon. It's not just more people are admitting it. It's, it's more people are actually engaging in the harmful, self-harmful activities uh, and being admitted to hospitals in um, starting with the millennial generation and here into uh, Gen Z as well. So that's why he's fighting that campaign campaign and trying to get parents to uh, expose their kids and encourage them to um, try things that are difficult and face some adversity and speak with somebody who disagrees with them uh, and, and, and live. And then Levogotsky's, Levogotsky's uh, research back from the 1930s uh, sort of sends the same message about what you're doing, your goals, your learning should be optimally challenging. Difficult and strenuous, but possible to do. And if they're too hard, it discourages you. And if they're too easy, it discourages you also uh, because you don't want to try anything hard because you're used to just winning and it being easy the whole time.